Mission Honourable Chair, this is where I hand over to my colleague, uh, Mr. Mr. Johnny Leroux. Mr. Leroux, uh, over to you, please. That's fine, um, HOU, you can delegate as you deem fit until you uh, you are done, so you don't have Thank to, you. so you can manage our time now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Advocate Mutibi, and uh, I want to greet the Chairperson of SCOPA and the Honourable Members. Uh, I'm uh, grateful for the opportunity to present uh, this investigation to SCOPA. So um, what we are looking at is uh, currently firstly starting off with matters covered under the proclamation being R23 of uh, 2020. So um, the awareness campaign is what we started with and that's the matter that falls within the proclamation R23. The AG's findings suggested that no proper SEM process was followed to appoint at least five companies for the awareness campaign and that the appointments were made based on the motivation for sole service providers. The SIU commenced its investigation into the matter on the 24th of August 2020. That's after receiving the Auditor General's findings and the value of the five contracts amount to 6.1 million rand. We are now going into the service providers, and these are the RFQs that were put out and the respective values. It was for radio advertising on RFQ 2658 for 184,000 Rand, RFQ 256 for 899,256 Rand and 50 cents, an advertising campaign for 1,290,300 Rand. Advertising campaign again for 877,680 Rand, and then campaign RFQ 25 or 2654 for 2 million 892 Rand, 540 Rand and 38 cents, which then brings us to a total of 6 million 144,351 Rand and 68 cents. Uh, these five service providers were required to conduct advertising campaigns in order to create awareness about the UIF COVID-19 TERS for the duration of 45 seconds for three spots per day for four weeks on their respective radio channels and related television channels. The UIF's BAC requested for a deviation from the normal procurement process in order to appoint the service providers. All the service providers were appointed on a deviation. The SIU is conducting a full-scale investigation in order to confirm and or refute corruption, maladministration allegations, and or to determine if there were any undue benefits or gratification paid to the UIF officials to influence the process um, of the SCM. The investigation includes the following. The SIU reviewed all the SEM-related documents, which included all the related contracts and invoices. The SIU reviewed all the relevant minutes and audio recordings of the two BAC meetings relating to these appointments. We interviewed all the key UIF officials that dealt with the SEM process, and we obtained 14 affidavits from several SI, uh, UIF officials. Moving along, the team interviewed the identified company directors related to the five service uh, providers and obtained their affidavits of some of them. The team is in the process of reviewing personnel files, emails, and additional information or evidence. Furthermore, the team is conducting a financial profile of specific UIF officials and identified service providers. A sequence of events timeline was prepared for each of the five service providers, highlighting the regular SEM processes. We interviewed a representative of the Independent Communication Authority of South Africa, in inverted commas, ICASA, who provided an affidavit and relevant information. And we interviewed one official from the GCIS, uh, the Government Communication and Information Systems, regarding similar requests from state institutions in the past. Progress to date, most radio and television advertising from all government departments are usually done through the GCIS. The UIF did not contact GCIS due to the alleged urgency of the awareness campaign. One official from SEM assumed the request for quotation to be an emergency 
and the specifications were provided. The SEM department failed to source service providers on behalf of the communications and marketing department. The communication and marketing department conceded that the problem was with the interpretation of the term sole service provider and acknowledged that the appointments were irregular. The BAC requested for deviation from the normal SEM process to appoint these five service providers. One BAC member that we interviewed stated that he signed for a recommendation for the SABC to be the only entity to broadcast the awareness campaign since the SABC accommodated 11 South African languages or all South African languages. This initiative was allegedly going to save the UIF money and time, however, he was overruled. The team is in the process of verifying this information with the audio recordings of the two BAC meetings. ICASA provided a list of all commercial radio stations and television channels, and they are 27 commercial radio stations, 16 public radio stations, nine commercial television channels, three public channels, and 70 community radio stations. The five service providers were appointed without following the proper SEM process. Where relevant, practice note number eight of 2007 and eight requires that for all procurement of goods and services not exceeding 500,000, at least three quotations must be obtained. This was not followed as it was motivated that the five companies were sole service providers. These appointments were not in compliance with section 217 in brackets one of the constitution and section 51 in brackets 1A3 of the PFMA. The UIF acted unlawfully because there were other commercial radio stations registered with the CASA in those provinces. Furthermore, the SABC was able to deliver the same message through 11 languages. The communication and marketing department misrepresented to the BAC that the service providers were sole source service providers and the misrepresentation caused the UIF actual prejudice. One SEM official failed in her duties when she allowed the marketing and communications department to predetermine the names of the service providers on the specifications. This failure resulted in an irregular expenditure of the UIF. The recommendations, approval, appointments, and the payments of these service providers were in contravention of Section 51A3 of the Public Finance Management Act. Now we move over um, to the type of um, outcomes that we are expecting, disciplinary referrals. The team is in the process to finalize the evidence packs against 14 UIF officials. Under criminal referrals will be determined subsequent to the review of the emails, personnel files, and the financial information which involves the profile. Civil litigation, Appropriate litigation will be considered by the SIT. Now we are moving over to matters investigated under the secondment agreement. So the secondment agreement, based on the key audit observations made by the AGSA, a secondment agreement dated 5 September 2020 between the Department of Employment and Labor and the SIU was entered into. Temporary Employment Relief Scheme benefit. The Auditor General of South Africa made a commitment to the president to assist government in dealing with the financial management risks posed by the emergency measures taken due to the outbreak of the global coronavirus pandemic. Based on the aforementioned and as part of their interim audit, their focus was on one, COVID-19 related account balances and classes of transactions and compliance with key legislation applicable to the COVID-19 related transactions funds and processes. The COVID-19 TERS benefit is an intervention by the Department of Employ uh, Employment and Labor through the Unemployment Insurance Fund to compensate employees that find themselves temporarily unemployed during the lockdown period due to the national disaster caused by COVID-19. The following slide deals with the key audit observations made by the AGSA. There are exactly 30 that have been identified by the SIU. Its ID number is the same as the UIF employees. Deceased individuals paid uh, TERS benefits. 
Individuals who are imprisoned were paid benefits, double dipping, bank details same as the UIF employees, individuals sharing banking details, individuals with invalid ID numbers, double dipping within the UIF, payments above the maximum threshold, overpayments, underpayments, duplicate payments, unsubstantiated payments made, unsubstantiated applications made, payments to foreign nationals, applic applicants that are below the legal age of employment, lack of consideration of salary portion paid by employer in the calculation of payouts for first lockdown period, lack of verification of employee salary submitted during the benefit claims, claims with, the, with an application date after the payment date, employer verifications, claims with no application date or approval date, fraud risks related to the manual application process, fraud risks related to the manual and online application process, incorrect system cal calculations of the TERS benefit payment for the first lockdown period, inadequate controls to verify employer details, lack of controls to verify of applicants representing employers, inadequate system functionality to utilize bank confirmation uploaded on the system to verify banking details, non-compliance with the instruction note, discrepancies relating to the appointment of service providers, and unfair award of contracts. The secondment agreement dated 5 September 2020 stated that the team of secondees will focus on the following as an interim. So what we did is we focused on government employees with personal numbers claiming from the fund, SANDF staff claiming from the fund, inmates claiming from the fund, UIF employees claiming from the relief fund, excessive amounts claimed by individuals and or companies, incorrect system calculations, duplicate payments to beneficiaries and individuals who are on SASA grants like old age and disability grants claiming from the fund. Now we're dealing with the UIF data. The secondment team initially experienced challenges with regards to the data from the UIF due to incompatibility with the SIU's databases and systems. To alleviate this problem, the team relied on the data provided by the AGSA used during the audit process. Status of the secondment investigation. The team obtained a high level understanding of some of the processes adopted by the UIF relevant to the TERS benefit. The team interviewed several officials from the UIF. The team collected valuable information, which at this stage is untested and are currently being tested. To date, the secondment team analyzed the data from the AGSA and based on the key audit observations made by the AGSA, decided to concentrate on the following aspects. The SANDF staff who claim from the relief fund. The SAND staff represents 78 exceptions amounting to 327,638 rand relating to the TERS benefit paid to the individuals linked to the SANDF employment. A total of 59 SANDF members associated to 55 bank accounts were identified. Furthermore, three bank accounts have multiple beneficiaries and four SANDF members have multiple bank accounts. Inmates claiming from the fund, seven DCS inmates were identified to be claiming from the relief fund to a total of 40,657 rand and 93 cents. Then we had deceased individuals who were paid TERS benefits totaling to 441,144 rand and 34 cents, which represents 68 deceased beneficiaries making use of 72 bank accounts. Furthermore, two bank accounts depicted multiple beneficiaries and uh, seven deceased beneficiaries had multiple bank accounts. Government officials claiming from the fund, 6,140 officials were identified, claiming from the fund, totaling 41 million uh, and 9,737 rand and 70 cents, making use of 3,959 bank accounts. Of the 3,959 bank accounts identified, 581 accounts were associated to multiple beneficiaries, to 3,079 beneficiaries. 55 beneficiaries were identified with no bank accounts, amounting to 301,124 rand and 19 cents. 
So this, the status of the secondment investigation, based on the aforementioned, the team prepared letters to the following institutions requesting specific details on the key audit observations made by the AGSA. So we prepared letters to the SANDF, DCS, and the Department of Home Affairs to confirm the status of the IP numbers, and that would include all three departments, such as ID numbers, are they still employed, etc. These letters were delivered to the aforementioned institutions for action on the 23rd of October, 2020. The SIU was alerted on the 22nd of October that 11 suspects were arrested relating to fraud perpetrated against the UIF. The information as depicted in the following slide shows arrests made by the Hawks. The SAU is in the process of applying for the extension of the current COVID-19 proclamation in order to investigate all TERS matters, which are with an estimated value of 985 million rand. Here, uh, the chair can see and, and honorable members can see the case numbers, the police station where those case numbers are registered, the company names which uh, were then regarded as uh, suspects in the matter. The potential value, uh, the amount recovered by the UIF, and then and the last column is the number of arrests. So the first is um, the mega bus and coach uh, claimed four million eight hundred and four thousand eight hundred and thirty four rand and sixty five cents, and of that the UIF recovered four million seven hundred and five thousand two hundred and five rand and seventy eight cents. CSG resourcing PTY limit claimed 5,689,377 rand and 60 cents. Nothing has been recovered, but five suspects have been arrested. National adhesive distributor CC UIF reference 692,185 rand and 55 cents were claimed, of which three suspects were arrested. Mutiti uh, drop in center. 3,166,498 rand, one suspect arrested, and then KBAC fluorine PTY limit claimed 128,878 rand and 40 cents, and one suspect arrested. That is a total of 14,481,774 rand and 20 cents that were claimed, and a recovery of, as I said previously, the 4.7 million with a total of 11 suspects arrested, and the SIU is obviously monitoring these matters. Then, uh, cases currently under uh, investigation by the Special Commercial Crimes Unit in Pretoria, a total of 70 criminal cases were registered with the SAPS and are currently under investigation. No arrests have been made in relation to these matters. The total value of all the 70 matters amount to 1,490,436 rand and 15 cents. The SIU is working together with law, other law enforcement agencies and the Fusion Hub to deal with these matters. I thank you. I hand over to you, Advocate Matibi. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Leroux. Uh, honorable Chair, honorable members, uh, although there has been some outcomes reached, the investigation is ongoing and uh, we are hoping to further uncover uh, any of the irregularities or possible corruption that could have been committed. Uh, to date, there is a clear indication that uh, at the UIF, there was a failure of people, process and systems. And this requires an urgent attention. Um, we have read the minister is on record uh, saying that uh, the UIF is attending to these processes. Uh, we are heartened that SCOPA will be conducting a site visit uh, so that uh, they could monitor uh, the, 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 the UIF. So we look forward to uh, even producing further legal outcomes and the systemic recommendations so that the maladministration and the corruption that is endemic there could be uh, rooted out, mitigated, and prevented going forward. Thank you very much, Chair. We appreciate the opportunity. Okay, thank you very much, uh, HOU. Well, quite clearly, all that you have said is a vindication for us as this committee, uh, because we pointed to these challenges uh, when we last met with the uh, UIF, and um, when we pointed to them, 
they tried to, you know, explain themselves in a manner which was not satisfactory. And I was reminded of the saying, the lady doth protest too much me things. And I think I can quite succinctly adapt it to say, I thought then as I do now that the commissioner doth protest too much. Right, colleagues, we will hand over to the AG and then we will um, feel, they will field questions uh, on both because the matters are somewhat uh, interrelated. I'm going to over to you and your team. Thank you, thank you very much, Chair. And uh, good morning to all the members present. Um, Chair, just as an introductory comment, I think all members will recall that on the 2nd of uh, September, we released our, our first report on the COVID-19 expenditure, covering among others the UIF. Uh, at that point, uh, the actual expenditure was somewhere around 41 billion up to that point. Uh, it is pleasing to note, Chair, that the matters that were surfaced from that report are already receiving attention as we had looked at the presentation from the colleagues at the SIU. We'd like to commend them for taking those urgent steps to make sure that the matters that were in our report do not fester, but do get taken to the next level, including by the rest of the colleagues in the Fusion Center. Uh, having listened to the presentation from the SIU colleagues, Chair, the rest of the work that we are doing now, which we are hoping to report in our second report by the end of uh, November, is going to largely contain matters based on the follow-up work, including other work that we would have done as an audit office for the period after July 2020 to date. So on that note, Chair, and I'm hoping that uh, Smongil, uh, my colleague who's gonna be running the presentation, will take the cue from the colleagues' presentation of the SIU and cover those areas that have not already been emphasized in their presentation. I know I'm trying my luck here, but I'm sure she will adapt based on what has been presented and give you a sense of where are we. But I, would, I, I have a sense that the bulk of the issues that will preoccupy our mind uh, what has been done in the period subsequent to our report. Let me hand over to Smongi, the chair, who is the lead uh, executive on this portfolio, and she will take the committee through what we have prepared on our side. Smongi, please, thank, thank you very much. Um, good, good morning. Uh, Chairperson, good morning, honorable members, and, and thank you, AG, um, for the opportunity to present. I, I also did note that uh, most of the findings were covered by the, the, the SIU colleagues that just gave the presentation. So I'll try to just expand on the ones where I feel that um, maybe additional information could be useful to, to the members. AG has already started talking about the work that we're doing um, that would inform the SR2 report that we'll be tabling shortly. But in the main, maybe just give a sense of where we are right now. So we are obviously there at UIF doing the work that would inform the findings for the um, SR2. In the main, it's the follow-up work. So we have engaged with UIF and, and, and they've given us a sense of where they are uh, with implementing the, the action plans they've committed to. Um, we have audited the majority of them. We are currently just in the in the state of engaging with them and discussing some of the observations that we have, so that we could we could we could finalize on that front. But also, um, we have finalized the the data up to September, and you would note that most of those actions would have been implemented in September. So they are some of the findings that uh, would continue would still come up as exception. Um, and purely because UIF would not have responded to the gaps that we've, we've flagged initially. And we'll also test um, the payments that we've made subsequent to the changes being made so that we could get a sense of whether those changes are effective 
or, or not. So I won't spend a lot of time on the background. I think if you could just move to a slide eight uh, so that we could just start getting into the to the findings. And I think it is, I've noted the ones where um, SIU has covered, I'll just go through them quite quickly. So the first one there, so what we've done, we've categorized the findings into four sections. The one was where we were just understanding the systems at UIF, based from both from the process perspective, but also in terms of how the system was configured. And we have observations um, around that. And the second part would be data analytics. And, and, and what we've done around the data analytics is we did get the information from UIF, the data, um, from the application process right up to the payment process. And we've analyzed that data to, to pick up the gaps. But in addition to that, we've um, used different databases from government to help us in, in our analysis. So the first one that I will just want to talk to is, is that there we were raising three points, really. And it was around the verification of the um, individuals that are representing employers in the application process. So we were saying that the system at UIF was not necessarily prohibiting an, a single um, person to represent a multiple of employers or bargaining council. So you'll find that one person um, is putting applications on behalf of uh, multiple employers or, or bargaining councils. But secondly, that the, the UIF was not necessarily having processes in place to, to verify that this a person um, representing the employers is duly authorized to, to, to submit the application on their, on their behalf. And thirdly, that the information, the input data that was being presented by, by this individual representing the employers was not verified, which obviously does mean that the uh, adequate preventative controls in place around that area um, to ensure that where somebody is submitting an invalid play, a claim or they're purporting um, to be presenting, representing someone that is being picked up so that it can be dealt with uh, appropriately. The second part, I think the SIU colleagues have spoken to it, so I won't dwell into it. We were saying that in the in the in the first lockdown period, to the 27th to the 30th of April, the system had a standardized number of days, which was about 35 days. And when they were calculating the payment itself, they would use this standard period, and they would not necessarily look at the actual claim, the number of days that are included in the actual claim, which resulted in 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 uh, overpayment in a lot of instances. Um, the, the next one, which talks to the uh, inadequate verification of employer details, um, which is on the next slide, what we were, were flagging there were really the risk around the, the lack of adequate processes to verify the claims that are being submitted. The, what the UIF system was able to do was to use the UIF reference number um, to, as, a, as, a, as a means of verifying the validity uh, of, of this employer. But we're saying that there are other um, areas that could have been looked at to verify, like your CICP information, telephone numbers, and all of that. And what that would have prevented really was to ensure that all the employers that are submitting claim are actually a companies that are registered and that are actually doing business, conducting business, um, and would have actually just helped to prevent um, non-existing companies from, from, from applying. Um, the bank, the next one, which is number four, at a high level was bank confirmation. What we, were, what we had observed is that as part of the documents that UIF had requested, um, one of those documents was a bank confirmation, which the intention was that that would be proof that the bank account you're listing there is valid and it belongs to that company. But what we observed was that they didn't have checks and balances in place to ensure that before payment is made, they are comparing the bank account to which they are making the payment to the, the document, the bank confirmation, to make sure that you are paying the, the right person and you, you're paying it to the correct bank account, which, which was a flaw in the system because you might end up paying to incorrect bank accounts and it becomes difficult to recover uh, the, the funds later, later on. I'll also move to 
the next one on, on number five. And most of this is just risk that we are flagging where it could potentially result in uh, overpayment uh, being, being made. Um, on this one, what we're saying is during the first lockdown, some of the employers would have paid a portion of the salary and they were submitting a claim to the UIF for the portion that they were not going to cover. But the UIF system did not take the, the part that the employer was paying into account when they were calculating the benefits to, 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 to pass through to the individual. And in some instances, what that resulted to is that the employee um, would end up getting paid more than the, the, really their salary, which was not the, the intention. So we're flagging that, um, which we picked up from the, from the first uh, lockdown. Number six, the, the, the observation that we're making is that UIF did not have preventative controls. If you, maybe if you take a step back, um, you'll have the um, employees who would have been registered by the fund. And obviously on month to month basis, the employer will declare the, the employees but also together with their salaries. And that was obviously used to, to calculate the fee that gets paid to UIF. But during the, the test benefit, um, UIF did not have a process of checking whether the salary that the employer is, is, is uh, declaring is aligned to what they've been declaring all along, uh, which was the basis of insuring these this employees. So that verification was not done. And obviously the risk there is that some employers might claim that an individual is earning more than what they actually would actually earn so that they, they could uh, get a, a higher a benefit. So, so that, that observation was made there. And, and that maybe at a high level, it sums up some of the preventative controls that we're saying that there are gaps in the system and we had obviously asked UIF to, to, to cover them. The next section, bulk of it would be covered by the colleagues from the SIU, because the next observations are around the data analytics themselves. And I will just go through the ones they didn't cover. I, I would move through the, the slides uh, quite quickly. I think the first one, what we had done is we obviously took all the, 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 the data of all the individuals that have been paid, and we analyzed it and compared it to the UIA, sorry, the Home Affairs database. And what we picked up was they, are, they were individuals that were below the, the employ, legal employment age of 15 that were paid uh, by the fund as part of the, the terrorist benefit. Um, the, the number eight at SIU has covered, which is the um, identity, identity ID number, that we've picked up belonging to, um, that is the same as the employee of the UIF. So I would not dwell into that. And number nine on slide number 12, um, is talking to a payments that were made, terms payment that were made to individuals that are deceased according to home affairs. And I think the colleagues have covered that. Um, we're also gonna jump the imprisoned individuals because they've already given um, a details of that. I would want to move to slide 13, number 12, which is the payment to foreign nationals. So the observation we've made today, um, which would be on this next slide, is that number 12 there. What we have done there is we, we, we do understand that UIF has made payment to um, employees who are foreign, foreign nationals. Um, and, and we do accept that obviously where these employees were covered by the fund previously, then the, the fund um, can rightfully pay, pay them. What we have observed there is that as part of the payment, so two things is that one is UIF did make payments to uh, employees, foreign national employees that were not, have not contributed to the fund for the past 12 months. So basically um, empl employees that were not previously registered by the fund. But secondly, that UIF did not necessarily confirm whether these employees um, were um, either were having valid work permits or were refugees, basically saying they are legally in the country, legally in the country and they can, can work. Um, and I know that uh, as part of the response, UIF has indicated that this is an area that they will continue to, to pay. But what we're flagging is that obviously we need to reflect and look at what was the intention for making this payment? And how do we make sure that we respond to the risk that um, some of 
these claims might, might not be valid claims. If you think about the um, South, South, South African citizens, we're able to um, take the ID numbers and check against the, the Home Affairs database and see whether this is a valid ID. Uh, but obviously with the foreign nationals, especially if you can't find them in the Home Affairs database, then there are challenges around that, which could point, sort of increase the risk around uh, invalid claims being made. So I think we're highlighting that. And what we were we suggest or recommending is that this should be investigated to, to, to look at whether these claims were legitimate valid claims that the UIF intended to pay. And obviously where they are invalid claims that came through, that needs to be, to be, to be looked at. Um, Uh, you are muted. Um, if you can just unmute yourself and then retrace yourself to about 15 seconds ago. All right, there you go. Okay, sorry, I, I don't know what happened there. Um, I had closed the foreign nationals chair. I, I'm hoping you could still hear me there. And no, I was let's... moving to... Okay, carry on, that's fine. Okay, and I was moving to the next slide, Chair, um, indicating that the findings on the next slide would have covered, would have been covered by, by SIU in terms of the individual showing the, the banking, same banking details, and also the, the, the double dipping um, within the UIF. So I would not dwell into, into those ones. I will move to... Um, I will move to maybe maybe if I could just make a point on number 13 on the slide, uh, Chair. So I do note that the SIU colleagues are looking into this uh, a double dipping, especially the SNDF and the government employees um, and also the SASA employees. Maybe the point that I just wanted to make around the NEFAS is obviously when we did the analysis, we flagged the students who are um, who are paid from the TERS benefit. But at the same time, they are receiving stipends from, from NEFSAS. And, and, and what we were saying there is that obviously as, as government, we need to reflect on what was the intention of us um, agreeing to pay this tariff benefit, which was obviously to provide relief to, to, to um, the employees. But if you look at, was it the intention of this scheme to allow an individual to benefit from two government fu fu funding, one being the NEFSA stipend and the other one being, being obviously the TERS benefit from UIF. And that's something we need to, that government has to reflect on and, and oversight reflect on it, because I do know that that is one of the areas that UIF has said they will continue to pay. It's because obviously there isn't really a, a, a law that prohibits, prohibits them, anything that prohibits, prohibits them from, from paying it. And we were just, it's something that we are asking that, um, the leadership from UIF and obviously oversight reflect on it uh, going forward. I would maybe move to, to um, I want to move to, I think the others have been covered by the, the SIU colleagues. I'll move to slide 18 um, and I'll look there on some of the, the areas we've picked up on, on the payments which the colleagues haven't covered. Um, on slide 18, number 21, the, they were talking about unsubstantiated payments that have been made. And what we've done the chair is you, you have two systems. You have one, the application system that process when the individual from the starting point when the claim has been uh, submitted to the UIF up to when it is approved. You also have another system where it is the payment system. So what we've, we've looked at, what we've done is we've tried to, to uh, reconcile the two systems to look at whether all the um, tiers payments that have been made, were they approved from the application system, just to confirm that every payment that has been processed is uh, supported by an approved application that has been taken through all the processes. And we're saying those are transactions we couldn't reconcile. So we have about seven transactions that uh, we couldn't reconcile. And then on the number 22, we're saying that the application system did not have 
invoice numbers. And what that means is that we could not necessarily trace that to the payments to make sure that um, they have been paid. So because of the, the lack of the invoice or the, the one thing that links the application system to the payment system, then we, we were able to, to conclude on that. And we've asked that UIF performs a reconciliation of the transactions between the application system to what has been paid to ensure that they aren't um, one, applications that have been approved but have not been paid, but two, that all the applications that have been paid are supported by a, an, an approved uh, transaction. On number 23, which is the next slide that has been covered, uh, where uh, we have picked up payments that have been made, um, the, the payment date is before the application date, which ordinarily should, should not necessarily happen. So we flagged that, and I know the SIU colleagues have covered it. On slide 20, slide 20 deals with the SCM um, issues, observations, and those have been adequately covered in the, in the SIU presentation. I would not necessarily dwell on, on, on them a lot. The, the last, um, the, the slide 21, there we were flagging some of the fraud risk. And if you, you just reflect on this fraud risk a bit, you'll see that these are some of the risks we've highlighted um, and the observations we've made is an indication that some of this risk have actually materialized because we were talking about the lack of um, independent review and reconciliation. And you'll see that some of the, recon the recommendations we were making was that reconciliations have to be performed. We also talked about the lack of segregation of, of, of duties where obviously the lack of segregation of duties is there to make sure that um, you're separating the, 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 the processes, that if there are challenges or there are gaps or the, there are issues that needs to be flagged on these claims, they, they are flagged. So, so I think that would be part of the things that have compromised uh, the UIF from the processes perspective. Um, so, so I think that will talk to the fraud risk. The, the last slide really is we, we did select um, employers that uh, we wanted to visit to, to do a few things. One is to verify whether that employer exists, but secondly, to confirm some of the, the declarations that would have been made by these employers um, in their submission to, to the UAF. When we finalized the first SR, we had, as the, we had visited a few of them and we committed to fi finishing the the, the visits in the in the SR2. But on the few that we've done before we finalize the SR1, we already um, confirmed that there's one that we picked up uh, where by the time we got to, to, to the address that they'd indicated in the application, the, the, the premises were really deserted and it didn't look like um, the, there was a company there. So we, we couldn't do the test, which was a risk for us. It was just flagging the risk from the, the just the, the validity. Of, of, of the claim. And, and obviously one of the other observation is that when, even though we have um, tried to, to organize these visits in time, we had instances when, when we got there, we couldn't access the, the employer's premises because they indicated that they were not sufficiently prepared for the audit, which could also be just a, a risk indicator. Because if you have submitted these claims about two, three months ago, they should be easily accessible and should be able to, to, to easily access the information to, to help us with the audit. And AG, on the last slide, the conclusion, I think AG had already mentioned that um, some of the recommendations we've made in terms of the way forward, um, especially we were talking about um, making sure that the are stringent preventative controls implemented to minimize the risk of fraud and error that we've seen that there are um, actions that are being implemented to improve the system and also improve um, just the processes. We're also talking about investigations. And I think the presentation earlier did give us a sense that that is, is, is happening. So the, this slide, what is, is here in the slide, was more to, to, to um, recommend to, to the UIF that let's make sure that we focus on the preventative controls um, that would help us avoid the risk of fraud and error, but two, that we design um, detective controls that will help us pick up if there are errors that have been missed in the verification process. And the last one is obviously institution, instituting uh, investigation to try and recover the funds. 
um, from obviously the individuals that um, were not meant to to receive the claim. So I think in the nutshell, that's how um, um, the findings that I took you through, Chair. If there is a specific finding where you would like more detail, I'm, I'm happy to deal with it. Um, but also to close, I think, I'll link it back to the comments AG that has made around the work we're doing with now the SR2 in the main following up um, on the actions that have been made by the, the UIF, but also continuing to analyze the payment up until the 30th of, of September, September, and try and split that into two. Obviously, one would be before the UIF implemented the actions to respond to our findings, and then the other area would be where the, the um, actions have been implemented. That will give us a sense whether the, the actions implemented are effective or, or not. So I'll hand it back to, to AG uh, Chair. Um, thanks, AG. Right. Thanks very much, Slongile. Uh, AG is the Chair. <clears throat> um, I think Slongile has summarized the way forward, but I think I'd like to reinforce the point about the preventative controls. I think it's part of what we take away from this, that the UIF and many other funds, including programs, are ongoing activities that government carries out every month, every year. And there's no better set of controls than those that prevent some of these things from happening so that we don't have to worry about the follow-up activities afterwards. So we'd like to flag that point, while all of the other activities are taking place via the Fusion Center, we do want to put a stick on the ground for SCOPA to say that uh, the preventative control approach needs to be something that we embrace into the future because it will give us an elaborate set of insights into what is going wrong before we lose the money. Back to you, Chair. Thank you very much. All right. No, thank you very much, uh, AG. All right. Um, I think that too um, is a further a vindication really of our worst held fears about uh, the control deficiencies which characterized the UIF and were quite prevalent uh, and clear for us to see um, when we interacted with uh, the UIF. So uh, none of what uh, has been presented to us today, either by the SIU or the AG, it uh, comes as a surprise. Um, safe to say, of course, uh, we remain fundamentally disappointed and concerned at the fact that systems uh, continue to, you know, flounder in the manner in which uh, they are um, at the at the UIF, um, and it's clear that um, failing to plan is planning to fail. The kind of eventualities that we have arrived at because of COVID nineteen. Uh, whilst they may not have been um, anticipated in the scenario planning of every government department or entity, or in, a, in the corporation really um, should factor in the kind of uh, forecasting that there may be a disaster of this magnitude at any point. So thank you very much, AG and um, the SIU. I'm going to now hand over to colleagues and I see that uh, Honorable Lisa, the first one off the bat. Um, Mazamba, over to you, Bob. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me start by congratulating you on your collar and tie. And looks very impressive. Um, I'm Mr. inspired Chairman, by you, Mazamba. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you to, to both units for the good work um, they are doing on this on this project for want of another word. Um, it's what I have come to expect of Kimi over many years. And so thank you to you, um, Kimi, for the work you've done. Um, none of us are perfect and and I have at times been critical, but um, the, the, uh, the, there cannot be any real negative aspersions about your time in office. So thank you very much for that. Mr. Chairman, one of the, the difficulties, not difficulties, but one of the things I think we must be careful of is assuming that this process, this completely abnormal process involving TERS in particular, 
um, is going to continue indefinitely or be repeated. I think this is a once-off, and and the the emphasis really, um, and I think it is, um, should be on ensuring that those who have defrauded the system repay the money and go to jail, um, as opposed to designing a whole or well, try to perfect the system, which will never be used again. So I think that that, that, that is something we've got to be cautious about, pouring resources into designing a system which is, has seen the end of, or is coming to the end of its life in any event. However, the point that you make succinctly, and many of us have had to work with UIF and the Compensation Commissioner, for that matter, for, for years and decades, have experienced the the lack of of proper systems professionalism um, in those in those departments and of course the the STIRS, um, system is is simply a the, the flaws in this terms tour system is simply a reflection of the general malaise which which bugs the UIF um, from the call center to to all sorts of, of things, even the submission of monthly returns for the last three or four years, it's been almost impossible to do so online. And so people have either just not paid or they've been forced to go and stand in long queues at labor centers and try and do it manually and get a rubber stamp on, on the receipt. It's just a nightmare. And, uh, and so, as you say, quite rightly, it's really no surprise that the system um, used for the tourist payments had so many flaws, which is now are now being revealed. So, Mr. Chairman, I, I don't really have any direct questions, but um, like you, I have those those concerns and observations, and um, and I'm not sure that there's going to be a quick fix unless there's a complete change in the skills and 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 um, direction of of the executive at the UIF and the compensation commissioner thank you very much all right thank you very much honorable list honorable tolasha thank you very much chairperson good morning chairperson and honorable members uh, Honorable Chairperson, let me take this opportunity to welcome the presentation both from SIU and AG. Thank you very much. Uh, Chairperson, mine is not so big. However, I really want to assure the SIU and AG that we are behind them 24-7 in making sure that we achieve what the President announced to, to really make sure that we deal with anybody who is involved in these corrupt tendencies. Doesn't matter whose name the person is, where the person comes from. I really would want to recommit to say they must. I'm also quite impressed with the kind of work that has been done, Chair, especially by AG. Within a very short space of, space of time, they've been able to produce these reports. This chair is yeah. unprecedented. We appreciate them. Chair, the, from SIU, once again, they always impress me as well. I just want them to explain to me when they said there's double dipping. What, what does that mean? Chair, about, about UIF, it's like somebody knew that we are going to be uh, hit by uh, COVID-19. When you listen to how there are no systems in UIF, it's like they knew that there will be this kind of a pandemic. Hence, I'm saying, Chair, anybody and everybody who took advantage of this gauge must be brought to book. I've never heard of these kind of weaknesses in the in the in the UIF uh, systems. Uh, it's never heard of where you cannot have a system to check whether a person is in fact having a valid uh, ID. When a person can just, uh, as a student, 
being able to draw from UAF, it's, it's like it was deliberate, but I, I really wouldn't want to be emotional about it, but I want to celebrate these two institutions, but also to hear more from, from SIU when they talk double dipping, exactly what do they mean? Do they mean a student in NSFAS as well as getting some grant? Is that what they mean? I just want to hear that, Che. Thank you so much. All right, thank you very much, Mam Tulashe Babu Somia. Members, um, th thank you very much for the, the, the two reports, uh, one from the uh, SIU and the other uh, from uh, the Ota, Ota General. Um, uh, we we are sucking the blood out of him uh, before he exit exit the system. Um, uh, but uh, I, I I think indeed uh, for the AG um, for his consistency uh, around uh, the, the work and the commitment uh, to serve uh, the nation, uh, we really need to uh, appreciate that. And and uh, on his. Um, um the way out um his preparedness to share some of those um, uh, outstanding uh, instances in terms of his uh, uh, engagement um, um, um so thank, thanks thanks uh, thanks ag um so 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 i'm looking into the the various slides uh, on the um, original report of the auto general well, um, very interesting sites uh, go to the analysis uh, uh, which they have made um, uh, on the UIF, um, uh, taking into account uh, on the uh, received uh, applications and, and how those applications are finalized. So my interest is going to be, is going to be there, um, <clears throat> which, uh, a, a deal with those numbers of, of, of claims. For example, there, there, there is a, there's a slide on, on your original report um, uh, as, 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 as a tabled, which um, uh, starts with an indication of the number of days which are taken uh, before payments are made. So it's, it, it, that slide uh, is uh, somewhat in page, uh, uh, page 30, page 39 of your original report, the main report. Um, and and, and, and uh, it, it, it indicates that uh, the applications which are 30 days old um, at the time of the audit were uh, above, a little bit above 6 million uh, uh, of, of, those, of those applications. And, and um, it would be indicatively that uh, uh, such such uh, applications uh, would be attended um, a, a beyond a 30 day uh, period. And, and there were applications uh, between 30 days and 60 days old, which are about 11,000. And there were applications um, um, which were somewhat a bit uh, trickier for me. Um, uh, those uh, applications, the, the, the date, of processing is the same with the date of application. Um, uh, you see, it was about uh, uh, 202,311. Um, uh, and and uh, what, what is striking is that uh, looking into such a kind of an occurrence, you begin to uh, ask yourself as to what does this whole thing mean? Uh, you see that uh, here you are, you, you, you are sitting with a number of applications. Those uh, number of applications um, are somewhat looked into in the variance of time and, and the benefits uh, are, are somewhat uh, played, uh, paid outright. And, and as such, you would uh, look into the quantum uh, that application carries, and 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 uh, uh, for example, the 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 same day payment, 
same day application uh, uh, goes beyond uh, one billion one billion rands. So 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 for me, this, this the speed of carrying this task, um, and at the same time, the less speed of carrying this task uh, be, begins to carry some questions as to what is a causal factor uh, for us to see this kind uh, of a behavior uh, in as far as the systems uh, that uh, UIF carries, uh, both for application and uh, for payments, uh, for them to be able to achieve uh, this uh, kind of a, um, a questionable way of uh, dealing with their with their with their own work. The 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 second area is the area which I thought is going to somewhat affirm one of the points that the AG emphasizes overall um, uh, in in his uh, audit report uh, that that that. Uh, government carries multiplicity of uh, systems um, which are not talking uh, to each other and, and therefore exposing uh, the fiscals uh, more towards a, a risk uh, than it would have been if there have been some kind of consolidation in as far as such systems uh, are, are, are concerned. I, I, I really don't know uh, as to when such a finding is made uh, on a prolonged process of execution, uh, whether are we going to see any level of a drastic change in terms of processing um, some kind of transactions, which is going to improve uh, the, 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 the level of risk, uh, which is a uh, associated with such a kind of systems. I see that uh, SIU has, has been forced to run to various departments or entities uh, for verification of some of the information that they are seeking to um, clarify uh, on their own investigations. Um, and indeed, it then confirms what the AG uh, has found out that you, you have to take a longer route uh, to determine uh, the justice uh, of, of, of whatever process uh, that has been undertaken and the tools and instruments used uh, to uh, somewhat uh, evaluate and value uh, the contribution around such a tool or instrument um, one way uh, or the other. And, and uh, uh, well, well, Chair, this, this might be something which should not necessarily be carried uh, by the audit itself or the SIU. It's something which goes back uh, to those who carry the service, who are supposed to take the service forward in terms of benefit uh, to those who are awaiting to be served uh, as such, whether they are talking about UIF, whether they are talking about SASA, whether you're talking about NSFAS, as long as you carry that kind of a deficiency, uh, the risks multiply uh, uh, in, 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 in terms of the issuance uh, of the IDs, in terms of using such IDs, in terms of verification of such identities, and looking into uh, the, 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 the actual um, permeations uh, as uh, it is the case in terms of the heavy migrant uh, scenario uh, in the South African social environment, uh, looking into uh, those who are foreign nationals benefiting into the system and the system which does not carry uh, that kind of interaction uh, in as far as uh, uh, assessing uh, the actual uh, physical nature of benefit of such individuals, which carries that danger. Um, so, so, so th those are the uh, a few areas which I wanted to uh, comment uh, uh, on. Chair, the other one would be carried by uh, the the department or the UIF uh, itself 
uh, in terms of the uh, benefit claims uh, received per sector, uh, because if you stretch uh, the, the two uh, largest sectors, which uh, uh, are exposed uh, on the benefit lines at 29% and 25.8% in terms of the benefits at the time of the audit, uh, one goes to personal services and the other goes to trade. And if you have to take those two slides um, uh, uh, together, uh, in, in fact, in terms of the graphic uh, presentation, you would question where then is our economic benefit lies and uh, whether it is this true reflection uh, of where the economy uh, lies and, and uh, looking into the actual uh, benefit and the employees which are involved in those uh, uh, sectors and, and looking at the quantum of benefit as outlined by the AG. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chair. No, thank you very much, Honorable Somia. Um, can we go to Honorable Hutt and then give responses to the questions? No, thank you so much, um, Honorable Chair. Let me follow suit in welcoming um, reports presented. Um, I will not spoil uh, the good messages from the leadership uh, in thanking the AG. Chair, these reports, they really make us uh, very disturbed, Chair. Um, I don't have much to say in terms of the report because much of the work is still in progress. And uh, tomorrow, we'll be going to the headquarters of UIF uh, and we'll make sure that we do not leave any stone unturned in exposing these vultures, Aban Melissa, Ika, Malga, Hulmenwed. Chair, with the levels of unemployment, inequalities, and poverty in our country, it's very disturbing, Chair, to learn that you still have 6,140 civil servant state employees defrauding the very same state that put bread on their table to a tune which is approximately 41 million. Chair, we are also not respecting the debt. You have individuals, 68 claims from a diseased individuals to a tune of 441,000, Chair. This is very disturbing and shocking. Seven inmates, uh, in orange overalls, Chair, while serving your sentence. Someone is claiming on your behalf a uh, uh, relief while you are in jail to a tune of 40,000 rand, Chair. I am lost for words when you also have SASA beneficiaries, SASA beneficiaries, and NSF students. Not so long ago, we had fees must fall, free education. You still have NSFA students, SASA beneficiaries. I understand this argument about no law prohibiting uh, them from claiming, but here we're talking about South Africa, which is faced with a high level of unemployment. Where are the morals? Where are the ethics? Where are the values of us as South Africans when you're going to double dip in times of crisis? Chair, while SANTF was busy scoping and donoring our people in townships. You have some amongst them uh, uh, with a multiple account claiming relief from the very same fund. What happened to this country? What, what went wrong with our rainbow nation and Ubuntu J? You have underage uh, 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 child labor. We are told that they were underage individuals also claiming the fund. Chair Angaz Gutiwa Kala Nyonin, Mzans, Nimpela, Nipelelo Amazwi, Nikatazegile, Nitumele. Hence, I cannot wait for us to go to our oversight tomorrow in Pretoria, the UIF headquarters. These culprits must be brought to book. We're not going to leave any stone and turn in getting to the bottom of this. We cannot have, this is no longer about politics and corruption. These are civil servants. 
the country and the nation, we need to stand up and put an end to this. Thank you, SIU. Thank you, AG, for doing a sterling work. Nyabonga Sla. All right, um, colleagues, I think really all of us, uh, as HOU and AG, you can hear, um, not uh, surprised at all of this, given the fact that uh, we have pointed to these things before. But I think the biggest indictment, of course, is whilst there are shortcomings in the system, uh, you also have got people generally in the citizenry who are unafraid to take chances to exploit those vulnerabilities. And therefore that speaks generally to now corrupt society. Uh, and so those are all things we really um, have to look at. And I think it is incumbent on uh, leadership to begin a process of whilst on one hand self-reflecting, but on national reflection about how, whilst we lament public service corruption, in one way or the other, we are gravitating to a citizen that is jumping onto that bandwagon. I think that compounds our problem even further. Uh, and this does not in any way exonerate, um, you know, officials of the corruption which uh, they have you know, participated in, aided and abated and engineered uh, with the primary reason to loot the state. Um, I want to just, uh, HOU, get in uh, uh, further unpacking uh, on the 78 soldiers, SA and DF officials, just the set of circumstances around that. Uh, and I think, uh, from our research team, uh, if, 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 if questions can begin to be crafted to the SANDF itself on uh, those individuals, um, so we can get a full picture of the set of circumstances as to why uh, or why they were on the, the system and why they're beneficial. So I think, H.O., if you can just unpack for us uh, that because increasingly every interaction we are having one or the other is exposing some serious shortcomings in the SANTF. Uh, and it, 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 it obviously has to become a focus area. All right, I'm going to hand over to the HOU and the AG for responses and they will delegate as they deem fit um, in the teams that they have brought along with them. Over to you. <clears throat> Oh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Honorable Chair and Honorable Members. Uh, we appreciate the comments and uh, we will really make it our duty that uh, we carry those forward uh, in terms of uh, holding those who are responsible for all of these irregularities and uh, corrupt activities that they are held to account and the monies that have been lost uh, should be traced and recovered back to the state. Uh, as I indicated that uh, generally, the observation is that there has been a failure of people, process and systems, and both presentations really talk to that. From the people side, uh, one would observe that either there has been a measure of collusion uh, fraudulent activities that ultimately uh, result into this uh, corrupt activities. Uh, from a process perspective, is that uh, processes were clearly just deliberately overlooked or, or just uh, circumvented for purposes of paying out these monies uh, fraudulently. The system is very clear from all the presentations, in particular the AG's presentation, that the system, there was a lot of system failure, but of course there's a mixture of system failure and people, where people deliberately uh, circumvent the system uh, so that uh, the, this fraudulent and corrupt payments can be made. So in that regard, we will have to determine from an investigation perspective, uh, whether there has been all of these factors, are they, are they uh, interlinked to an extent of committing uh, 
these this offenses. So, Chair, um, I'd like to just really appreciate uh, uh, Honorable Lee's uh, comment in terms of lack, lack of proper systems, professional professionalism uh, from various areas of, uh, of UIF, call center and the others. And as we investigate further, we'll really dip or dive deep into those, uh, those shortcomings. Uh, Honorable Tolashe, um, thank you again for, for, the, for, the, for the comment. Uh, the term double dipping uh, really simplistically means that uh, you are unfairly or unlawfully getting benefits from uh, two sources uh, of, uh, of funds. So in a sense, it means that uh, uh, having looked at the people involved, we found that they have obtained income from two different sources. And of course, typically this would be in an illicit manner. Uh, and if I make an example, if you talk about SANDF officials or any, any government official, he would be employed by government, but during the time when this test was, uh, was declared, uh, this was meant to alleviate uh, the, the, the issues that were caused by uh, unemployment that would have resulted as a result of the uh, either COVID-19 related issues. So, so those who remained employed, uh, they did not really experience the hardship like those who lost employment. So in a sense, it meant that those who continued to be employed could not go and obtain uh, funds or any payment or benefit from the UIF or TES in particular. So if you were employed, you were to use the term dipping or being paid from the salary, but you also went now illicitly, unlawfully, corruptly to go and benefit from the, from the, from the UIF. So that is the double part, right? So, so, so we are saying uh, we have found those instances and those instances uh, should be punished. The investigation should now uh, dive deep and say, you know, uh, the extent to which a certain individual benefited, how did he or she benefit? Did he work with anybody? Did he collude with anyone internal to UIF? So the investigation will take that out. And ultimately, of course, we would need to get uh, those monies uh, paid back. So that's. That's really how high level I can ex really explain the double dipping part. As you could see, uh, the language is also used in the Auditor General's uh, presentation, but uh, uh, that's high level how I can, how I can explain it. Um, and indeed, uh, uh, Honorable Somio, we will, we will really make sure uh, that uh, uh, all those who are involved in all of this uh, irregular, corrupt activities. We point them out, and they should be uh, they should be uh, punished accordingly. As we indicated in our presentation, we are monitoring the criminal cases that have been opened, and uh, we will uh, monitor uh, them to conclusion, just so that uh, the, the, we meet out the appropriate criminal sanctions uh, to those who have been arrested. Uh, I'm going to pause here, Chair, and thank, thanks again uh, for the Chair's comments um, uh, where there are shortcomings in the system. It all speaks to the general society of corruption. We agree with that. Um, uh, that, uh, that is really something, uh, as society, that we really, really need to, 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 to address. Um, and I think going forward, we look forward to to the, to the national anti-corruption strategy being signed off ultimately and being rolled out 
and galvanizing the society on an ongoing basis to make sure that this culture is really dealt with. Uh, so we look forward to that. Chair, uh, I will hand over to my colleague, uh, Mr. Defeto, who will unpack this issue around the uh, SANDF uh, officials and the nature of the of the of the findings there. Uh, Mr. Lechetu, if you can just explain that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Advocate. Uh, I'm going to, with your permission, just do it okay. on behalf of Mr. Lechetu. Thank you. That, that's fine. That's fine. Thank you. So, as we illustrated, uh, Chair and uh, the rest of the members, on slide 28 uh, of our presentation, we made it uh, clear that we have submitted requests to the various government departments uh, for further information. So, our information, um, as we analysed the data from the um, AGSA, uh, illustrated the 78 in SANDF individuals uh, with their ID numbers and so forth, and then appears to have been receiving benefits from the TERS. So, as part of our investigation, we would then approach the employer, in this case the SANDF, to give us more details uh, to, for the SIU to be 100% certain that we are indeed dealing with individuals that are currently still employed and that there are no further anom anomalies that we need to go and um, determine. So, uh, the spreadsheet sent with the letter was an extract from the data from the AGSA, and that would then include the personal numbers of the individuals, the ID numbers, and uh, the request to them was then confirm that uh, these individuals are in fact employed, uh, are they currently employed, uh, what is their position, uh, salary levels, and etc. And then once we have that information, which would be available to the SIU this week, we would then approach the matter going forward in terms of uh, approaching the SANDF officials and verifying the information received, and we'll take the step from there in terms of bringing them to book, either disciplining them, registering criminal cases if there was indeed uh, information pointing to an offence committed, and that would also be uh, going back to the UIF, drawing the records from there, verifying that that information was indeed presented by that individual, and that, that would then amount to the SIU registering criminal cases and would then monitor those cases going forward. I thank you, Chair, and I thank you, Head of the Unit. Thank you, thank you, uh, Honourable Chair. Uh, well, I just made a point that uh, uh, my colleague made. Uh, once we receive that, that information from those various state institutions, uh, we, will, we will now you know, sort of analyze further and then just check the, the level of collusion that has been made. Uh, the, the point made by Honorable Hadebe uh, around this uh, underage uh, uh, people, uh, I don't, uh, we really don't have the exact age, but it would be interesting really to just determine, you know, the, 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 the underage and if somebody was below the transacting age, then it means there has been somebody who's assisting this person. Uh, and that really becomes a very worrying factor. Uh, but we will we will also uh, look at that. Chair, I will pause here and uh, thanks for the opportunity. Okay, thank you very much to the HOU and his team. Bob Margaret to AG and your team over to you. Uh, once again, thank you, Chair. Let me maybe just pay attention to the issues that uh, Honorable Somio raised particularly on the page 89, that table that uh, Honorable Somi you referred to is a very perfect example of what happens when we have not put our control measures in place. Just thinking about some application, for example, you mentioned in that table, certain application dates for the benefit of the UIF tariffs were the same as payment date. And others, the application date was after the payment date. And those amounts are quite big. 
And no wonder the findings that we have made, because what it tells us is that not much work has been done to verify the information that has been put on the application. If on the day you receive it, you are already in a position to pay something like 1.1 billion on that same day. It means that the verification processes as well as the validation controls that need to be put in place are unlikely to be done in the same day for such a volume of transactions. It therefore highlights the risk that the basis for these deficiencies was also to do with the fact that there was not sufficient time taken or invested by the people who were processing these transactions at the UIF to satisfy themselves that indeed when they press the send button for the money to be paid, they are all happy about the detail as well as the parameters within which the payment is being made. You can take it a bit further, Chair, and say, in an electronic processing environment, there are many people who remain invisible to a lot of us. They could be here in the country, and they could be operating from somewhere else. If the controls in the information systems environment are not strong, those people also have the capability to illicitly obtain ID numbers of various people, submit applications purporting to be those individuals, and if a fund does not have the requisite control processes to check, the chances are that you might pay those people without having been any wiser. Then people who target information systems environments chair do that. You'll recall recently, during the time that we were in lockdown, one of the companies that keep our credit information was hacked into. So everybody who has got their name on that database their ID number appears alongside their name. And I think one of the things we need to start thinking about is that as we go into the future, there are many departments and state organs and agencies that are going to commit to doing things in the electronic environment. But the reality of the situation is that in the electronic environment, we are not there all by ourselves. There are other people who are piggybacking on us who we do not know, nor do we know their intentions. Hence the need for some of these preventative controls to be loaded on the electronic environment chair. I often think about my experience at the ATM. If the ATM chair allowed for me to put something in an envelope and I purport this particular thing in an envelope to be a check which I'm depositing into my account and I do it in a shopping mall at the ATM where I slip in the envelope and I say there's 5,000 runs in that envelope. If the bank did not have preventative controls and I come back three minutes later to withdraw against that 5,000 rands. I'm sure most banks would have been bankrupt by now. And the reason that they are not is because when you do that deposit, the bank has got a system in place which says that wait for whatever number of days before these funds are cleared as deposited into your account. After we have satisfied ourselves as the bank that that envelope that you deposited on Sunday afternoon is indeed valid money. Another thing is what is 
gonna need to be addressed on an ongoing basis when it comes to processing transactions in an electronic environment. Otherwise, anyone who's running out of money can easily pick up a piece of paper, put it in an envelope, make it sound like it's a deposit to their account, withdraw it and leave the country without anyone tracing them afterwards. So that to me, Chair, is one of the things that we need to begin to look at and say, how do we, from an oversight point of view, assist in fortifying the environments where huge amounts of money are processed in government? Because some of them can lend themselves easily to a proactive audit. Others, which are like infrastructure layout and delivery, may not necessarily respond to a proactive timely audit as compared to other transactions like UIF and SASA benefits and all of that. So I think Jay, as we ponder the future and looking at the kind of volumes of transactions that we have to pay to third parties, to what extent do we have the requisite security in our systems environment? To what extent do we have reliable application controls? Application controls being those controls that enable us to know if there is an exception to some of the rules that we have written in the electronic systems that process our transactions. So I think Chair, that uh, table on page 39, from my point of view, is quite a telling example of what would happen generally if there's no evidence of time being taken to analyze, to review, and to validate transactions. And I hope that that will assist in amplifying the points that uh, Honorable Somio raised earlier on. <clears throat> as far as the double dipping side of things is concerned, Chair, I can confirm that the English dictionary that advocate and the Mutidi reads from is the same as the one that we also read from. So what he has said is exactly how we have understood this. Because other people know government is not strong in some areas of control based on past audit outcomes. So they normally do what others do, throw the bait and hope that we are only gonna get fish. However, in most instances, we have seen that some throw the bait, hoping that nobody is going to check. If it goes through, then you can rest assured that they will submit even bigger claims in subsequent periods. And so, Chair, the vulnerabilities are not going to end now. It's just that we were in a situation where it was urgent for us to look at it from a multidisciplinary point of view. And we think that that has assisted in making sure that even as the UIF was reporting, I think last week, they were making some assertions to the fact that they have already recovered in the order of somewhere between 3.5 and 4.3 billion rands of some of the monies that they paid inappropriately to some of the companies that they were interacting with. So we we'll think Chair, that that's to us one of the key areas we need to look out for here while the orange overalls and other things are happening. But if we fortify our systems properly and we, all, we monitor them through the accounting officers, we can eliminate the bulk of what we are confronted with here. Thank you, Chair. Okay, no, thank you very much, uh, AG, HOU. Um, I think colleagues, we, we, we can bring it to an end really. This was to brief us and empower us and enable us to have the fundamental perspectives in so far as our oversight uh, visit to the UIF on Friday is concerned. And I think we have been able to go through um, all the salient points uh, which are necessary for us to uh, engage meaningfully with the department and of course the entity. But what is fundamentally clear is that um, corruption has uh, characterized uh, some of the operations at the UIF and consequence management, of course, will follow as and when these investigations are concluded. Hopefully, there will be successful um, prosecutions and recoveries for the state. 
But also, I think at the same time, um, particularly just around the issues around of um, the SANDF, if it is found that those soldiers uh, or officials of the SANDF were um, complicit in aiding and abetting the corruption, they should be dismissals. Uh, we cannot have a situation whereby people who continue to be on the payroll uh, of the state uh, then loot the state uh, much to the detriment of those who are in dire economic uh, straits as they push back on the frontiers of um, COVID-19 from an employment, uh, unemployment perspective. And so uh, that, that's how far these things need to go. They have to be dismissals. And I think that um, we'll be following up on that matter very, very seriously in so far as those areas are concerned. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, colleagues, I think it is increasingly becoming necessary uh, as pointed out in the past, that the reports of the SIU go to um, the presidency. Um, I will uh, crave and beg your indulgence that uh, we look for a date uh, in our already packed program uh, so that the presidency can take us uh, on board in terms of the implementation of the recommendations uh, which the SIU may have, have had and how they are responding to the findings um, of the SIU and of course the special audits that are going on because if this thing piles up uh, to the extent to which we it becomes a lot and we'll, some of the things will fall through the cracks and we are going to lose sight of the very very real uh, challenges so I think um, we will be it will be in the best interest of um, full-scale oversight on our part uh, to bring it full circle uh, and actually you now uh, invite the presidency uh, on those very key areas um, in so far as COVID-19 uh, expenditure is, 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 is concerned. Um, so <clears throat> I think colleagues, uh, as I indicated, we, we came into this as in a state of chaos and that their systems are not up to date and that they are vulnerable and prone to uh, abuse and corruption and what we have heard today from both the SIU and the AG um, confirms that and so we are uh, well within our rights uh, to have actually decided that we would want to go and interact with uh, the, 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 the UIF um, at that point. I'm told that uh, uh, I may have conveyed my thank you message to the AG uh, early and some people may not have heard it. Um, I'm not going to repeat it, save to say, AG, once again, thank you very much. And um, maybe, hopefully, um, before uh, you step down at the end of November, you would have had another opportunity to engage with us. But in the event that uh, you don't, we don't meet, I do want to borrow the words of one poet uh, who says, and I quote, may the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be ever at your back and may the sun shine warm upon your face and may the rain fall softly on your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the hollow of his hand. So with that, we wish you well for your future endeavors. And once again, we want to say thank you for the very healthy relationship that we have had. And um, I do believe uh, that our paths will cross again, as I know you will not be lost uh, to the country, as all you have ever been is a patriot. And so I believe that all that will be what characterizes um, your outlook moving forward. Uh, once again, Mam Dolasha, we want to thank you and your uh, team, your ad hoc committee for a job well done. I think whilst you, it was an ad hoc committee, the knowledge that you were a member of SCOPA was uh, in, in clear the manner in which you handled that entire process. So, Sbongala cool. Colleagues, uh, we can bring it to an end at that. Uh, we will meet uh, at the UIF on Friday. Sistombi and Putben and Lungisa will uh, be communicating with the members who will be uh, attending that oversight. I will request uh, AG and HOU. Uh, that um, officials from your office um, be made available to us uh, on Friday 
for ease of reference and cross-checking and fact-checking as and when we interact and engage uh, with the UIF and the Department of Employment and Labor. I think this is one of the most important uh, oversights we will, we will undertake uh, during this time of uh, COVID-19, just given the gravity of the situation which continues to, 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 to confront us and the risks of irresponsible behavior, which may uh, fast track the second wave. Uh, and whilst uh, the, uh, a lockdown is not on the cards yet, and so far as going back to level three, four or five, but I think the warning must go out to South Africans that we're not out of the woods. Uh, and if we behave in a reckless manner, we are putting ourselves at risk, not just health wise, but um, economically as well. I think if we are serious uh, about uh, coming out of this, let us exercise that behavior because we don't want a situation where by further jobs are going to be lost as we probably risk going back to another lockdown. So those are all the considerations we have to make. And I think from a public accounts perspective, uh, it's quite clear that the public press is already far stretched beyond its limits. And so every effort needs to be done to protect uh, the public purse, but also at the same time, we will get back into jobs and generate taxes um, so that we can be able to um, you know, meet the competing priorities. So I think that message does need to go out that let us be responsible, wear a mask, social distance, sanitize, and let's not be reckless and irresponsible. Particularly, I, Peggy and I as young people, let us tell the other young people this, open-ended partying and clubbing. Uh, aye, guys, no, no, no. Let, let, let us not, uh, let us not buy uh, and, and, and put ourselves at risk. Babu Dex, good to see you. Uh, Siabonga Kulu. All right, yeah, colleagues, on that, so on that note, let us meet on Friday at the UIF offices in Pretoria. HOU and your team from the SIU, thank you. AG and your team, thank you very much. And colleagues and to our staff. Thank you. Thank you. Let's meet clock for the MTPBVS. Thank you. Everyone, thank you. Further. thank you very much. The meeting stands adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Indeed. Ubunanda Peli, Gupela Bantu. Yeah, I'm Pella. Two are S. Gusha, Gusha, so Latin. I want to check and Pella in meeting in the SIU Sort of JC Committee. Who started true? on the traveling to Pretoria, but also the decisions that you have already taken just to take each other on board. Thank you. Uh, maybe let's do this. Let, 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 let's have a committee caucus tomorrow in Pretoria uh, when we are there. Uh, and then Ulungisa is communicating the travel arrangements for members who are traveling. Uh, then we, we will have an opportunity to meet and finalize our approach uh, for the meeting on Friday. No, no, it's fine, Chair. I'm not, I'm not sure if Chair is aware that not the entire committee is traveling. Yeah, I, I, I heard the, the, the House Chairperson gave a quota in terms of in the names of those members who are traveling. Uh, to, 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 which, that's where I have a problem slightly, Chair, unless it can be explained. Oh, all right, I see, I see, okay. No, the decision of the quota was taken by the House chain. It was communicated to me uh, late afternoon yesterday. I did try to reach him and I've been unable to get hold of him. And uh, Babu Somi was trying to get through to him as well. Uh, I am not aware or briefed on the reasons cited, safe to say, we were advised that only six members may attend. We are going to try and still reach out to him uh, to see that we can increase the, the number of members, but it was not a decision taken by by us. We had applied for the full committee in the no, no, If I may, Chair, so, sorry for... No, 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 no problem. No problem at all. No, no. chair. I, I thought you, if you are dealing with the matter with the with the uh, house chair, it's 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 fine right? because that's where we need it to be taken into confidence. That how come that scope would be given some uh, restrictions when we want to do our job? 
if there are financial implications, why is that you are not taken through quite earlier before you embark on this program? Or why is the program not costed so that you would be able to choose which trip would be important than the right? I don't think, Chair, it's correct. I, I respect very much the House Chair, but the way you are being dealt with as Chairperson on our behalf, I don't think it's fair, Chairperson. I don't think it's fair at all because there might be reasons that made him to take that decision, but you need to be taken in confidence as members of your committee so that you are comfortable with what is 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 what becomes a rule because there's there's a lot that if this is not being clarified, it has a potential to create a lot of confusion, Chairperson. I'm being very honest with you. I really would want you to be informed properly on what informs that, that your committee, which I think for me, is one of the most important committees at this point in time. And it has got a very coherent program. And when you come up at a very later stage with some conditions without being explained to us, that can create some kind of, of a problem. Please, I really would want uh, to 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 appeal to you to say, get those reasons. Let be acceptable reasons, given the situation that we are in as Parliament and as the country. Thanks, Chair. All right. No, thank you very much. Any other comments, colleagues, on that matter? Chair. Yeah. Honourable Hatjebe. Yeah. No. Hopefully, it's it, it's all of us because we really do not want a situation where it's going to appear as if uh, unintentionally so we are prohibited from effecting our oversight. We have taken a sober and a conscious decision uh, that boardroom oversight does not give a true sense of what is really happening on the ground. And we have adopted an approach that for us to be effective uh, and adopt a preemptive and a preventative uh, measures in dealing with this uh, 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 irregular uh, and non-compliance to legislation, we ought to go and experience what's happening on the ground. Now, if we are going to be limited uh, uh, based on reasons that we still have to be uh, uh, provided with, uh, uh, as things stand, some of us might feel that we are being uh, unfairly so or unintentionally prohibited from conducting our effective oversight. And it's not nice when we work as a committee on certain uh, 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 key and critical uh, aspect of our work. Some amongst us won't be afforded an opportunity uh, uh, to conduct and continue to, to, to play that effective role of oversight. I mean, we are a standing committee on public accounts, Chair. That on its own should be taken into consideration. We've got a very huge uh, and a critical role to play uh, uh, within uh, uh, parliament and in the society in general. So if there are issues, at least proactively so, which could have been engaged so that we understand and we sing from the same hymn book. So I don't want to speculate at this current juncture, but safe to say that when matters of this nature ensue in future, a proactive, uh, because we apply for oversight and they get approved in time. So if there are anything untoward, at least a little proactive in our response so that we're not caught by surprise. On the eve of the oversight, we're told that you no know, um, certain number of members can go. Now it becomes difficult what barometer I'm going to use to decide who must go and who must who mustn't. Thank you, Chair. Okay, no, thank you much, colleagues. I'm advised that um, one of the reasons, as you can see, I'm on the phone on the side, uh, is that the, the PC on employment and labor will be uh, joining us because, uh, as you know, we have been asked to inform other committees if we are going to be. Uh, dealing with entities, so I'm advised that the, a, a component of the PC will be joining us. I may, I'll may request colleagues that uh, I, I, I still go back to the House Chair and give a report back to the committee, we'll circulate a memo 
uh, or interact in the group and advise on the, what uh, the, 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 the issues are. Uh, I was informed that we were taking with six members, uh, three from the ANC, uh, and then the chairperson and two from the opposition. So that is the number that was given. Um, I will uh, check uh, further with the house chair. I'll just request for time to do that because as I'm saying, <clears throat> I had tried to, 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 to interact with him as well. Mm -hmm. So may I come back to members probably say by two o'clock before the sitting starts or just afterwards and I will, I will give an update in terms of those matters. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Okay, colleagues, of course, of course. Okay, I've noted all the issues and the seriousness in which they've been, uh, and I think constructively so, been conveyed, uh, just about the nature of our work. So I will, uh, I will, I will engage with that. Okay, colleagues. Siya bong, siya bong, siya bong. All right, colleagues, have a wonderful afternoon. See you in the house. Shapo. Shap shap. Yeah.